this is Rachel here again. Sorry I'm a little bit in the dark. The day is drawing to a close. But anyway, it's what I'm saying is more important than whether you can see me or not. Um, if you've been watching my previous videos, you will probably recognise that one of my main concerns with Jehovah's Witnesses, or particularly with the leadership, is how they condemn all other professed Christians. Not just the actual church system that they belong to, but the individuals in those churches. Uh, in the 2013 July Watchtower, individuals within the churches were all referred to as weeds. And I'll just read what it says in one of, from one of those articles. So this is the July 15th. Page 12, uh, it's talking about the, the Bible students, uh, you know, being selected by Jesus. It says in paragraph 8, So Jesus judged them as true Christian wheat. He rejected all false Christians in the congregation and those in the churches of Christendom. And they, they state in the article that this uh, started, uh, this harvest work started in 1914. Um, and in fact, the years, uh, the days text of the following year, uh, actually, sorry, 2015, on the October 5th, it actually refers to this article and it, it says he rejected imitation Christians, including all of those found within the churches of Christendom. So it's very plain that every individual within the churches of Christendom is considered a weed or an imitation Christian by the governing body. So the governing body, as you uh, realise, will teach that Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true Christian organisation on earth. They do acknowledge that there are millions who claim to be Christians fr from the... 2014 July 15th Watchtower in an article there uh, it says today millions may claim to be Christians but they disown God by their works because they are detestable and disobedient and not approved for good work of any sort. Okay so they don't have a very high opinion of all other professed Christians. Now this is one of the things that I have a beef with really. Um, during my years as a witness and all the return visits I had, there were many people that I called on who already professed to be Christian and they were good, kind, loving people. And um, I'd be hard pressed to find fault really with any of them in, in the way that they acted towards me and towards their neighbour. I had one elderly lady who used to, uh, she was Catholic in her late 80s, and she used to make uh, Christmas cakes, <gasps> Christmas cakes for all her neighbours. And she was really old. And you can imagine how much money that cost and how much energy it took out of her to do that. And she would knit baby booties and things for, for people in her street who were having babies. So a very lovely, loving, kind lady. And I think all Jehovah's Witnesses know people like that. So... Are we really going to say that they disown God by their works because they are detestable and disobedient and not approved for good work of any sort? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Anyway, um, what I want to do today is read through an article that I discovered a few years ago and I found it very, very good. And... Uh, it's from a, a website called jwreform.org. Now, I have no idea who wrote this and whether this uh, brother is still a, one of Jehovah's Witnesses or not, or whether he gave up trying to reform the organisation. But his article, I think, is very, very good, and it's good food for thought for Jehovah's Witnesses who are taught that their religion is the only true religion and that there's basically no good to be found in any other religion, uh, and especially those of Christendom. 
so what I'll do rather than just rambling on myself is I'll I'll just start reading the article it asks are Jehovah's Witnesses the only true religion by asking the question are Jehovah's Witnesses the only true religion we are not asking whether Jehovah's Witnesses practice a religion that is superior to others in many ways, or whether God looks with particular favour and approval on the members of this religion. We would not be Jehovah's Witnesses if we did not think this religion was better in some way. Nor are we inquiring whether there is no more truth in this religion than in others. We believe there is. We ask merely whether this religion, or religious organisation, is the only one that God accepts as valid and whether his spirit works only through the witness organisation and not through others. And he quotes here some, something from the Live Forever book, which is the book that I study from, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth, uh, which is going back you know, a few decades now. But on page 190, it says, It is only logical that there would be one true religion, this is in harmony with the fact that the true God is a God not of disorder but of peace. The Bible says that actually there is only one faith. Who then are the ones who form the body of true worshippers today? We do not hesitate to say that they are Jehovah's Witnesses. In another quote, more recent from the July 15, 2006 Watchtower, page 23, this is the only organisation in the world that is loyal to the sovereign of the universe. So very clearly the teaching of uh, the leadership is that it's the only true and acceptable religion or organisation. I'll carry on reading his article. At first thought, the claim of having exclusive divine approval may appear to be harmless, a source of pride and a wonderful faith and a means of encouragement and motivation to continue doing what is right. However, if it is not true, then it paints an inaccurate picture of Jehovah God, and this picture might be insulting to him, because it would show him to be more partial than he really is. That's a good point. So it is absolutely imperative that we be sure that this teaching is true, or else we might be defaming God by publishing it. Hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses may claim that they are the only religion favourable to God. If it can be established biblically, that is, it is impossible for more than one acceptable religion to exist. Yes, even more than one acceptable denomination of Christianity to exist. And that no other religion presently existing qualifies as acceptable in God's eyes, apart from theirs. And that God's plans to punish those who are associated with other religious groups even Christian ones. In order to establish their claim as heading the only legitimate religion, the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses often appeal to the scripture at Matthew 7 verse 15 to 23, where Jesus asserts in verse 21 that not everyone calling him Lord will be saved. The implication made by the watchtower is that when Jesus says not everyone, he means only one group. Interpreting the scripture not merely on an individual level, but on an organisational one. However, the most we can say about this saying of Jesus is that there will be certain individuals who claim to follow him, but who are workers of lawlessness. The emphasis is clearly on deeds rather than beliefs. Even if we were justified in interpreting this passage on an organisational level, it still does not say that there is only one true religious organisation. Also highlighted is the passage in verses 15 to 20, where Jesus warns his disciples to be careful of false prophets and tells them that they will be able to identify false prophets by their fruit. It is common in the Bible for a person's deeds to be referred to as fruit. The Watchtower interprets this passage on an organisational level as well. In other words, false prophets equals false religious organisations. From this assumed first principle, it can then be argued that true religion and false religions can be, argued, can be identified by their fruits. If a religion bears any bad fruit, 
that it cannot be true and therefore is condemned by God. Even if this interpretation is justified, it must be noted that the scripture does not explicitly say that only one true religion, prophet, can exist. Nevertheless, using Matthew 7, 15-20 as a springboard, the witness literature often provides a list of identifying marks, fruits, of acceptable religion and shows how Jehovah's Witnesses exhibit them all and other religions do not. The Bible, of course, does not give such a list. Rather, the Jehovah's Witness leaders compiled the list themselves and then noted how their religion fits it. Out of thousands of scriptures that speak of proper attitude and behaviour, a selection was made of what to include as marks of the true religion and what not. What not? Hmm. Sometimes the criteria are not explicitly stated in scripture. Let's look at the, first, at the list more closely. Okay, so then he goes on to look at uh, pages 145 to 151 from What Does the Bible Really Teach book? Um, how to identify the true religion. And anyone watching this video probably will be familiar with these points. Number one, God's servants base their teachings on the Bible. Two, those who practice the true religion worship only Jehovah and make his name known. Three, God's people show genuine and selfish love for one another. Four, true Christians accept Jesus as God's means of salvation. Five, true worshippers are no part of the world. Six, Jesus' true followers preach that God's kingdom is mankind's only hope. Okay, carrying on. The brevity... The brevity of the list indicates the sel selectivity of the witness teachers. Certainly, the Bible speaks of many more matters that should be important to Christians. So these simply are the items that the witness teachers feel are the most important. What is interesting is that the scriptures offered to establish these points do not say anything about there being marks of true Christianity, nor are they scriptural commands with the possible exception of John 13:35. For number three, but merely as statements of truth that we are to assume should be taken as mandatory to Christianity. Also interesting is that almost any Christian denomination in the world would agree with all these claims. The difference is in how they might interpret such statements. For example, many Christian denominations feel strongly that they follow the Bible. They merely interpret parts of it differently than the witness teachers do. They also believe Christians in their group show genuine love for one another. The debate is about whether they do this correctly or not. They also believe strongly that Jesus is God's means of salvation and that God's kingdom is mankind's only hope. They simply may believe something different about what the kingdom actually is. Thus we see that it is not the simple fact that other religions don't believe in following these stipulations, but rather that the witness teachers claim others are not following them properly. So there would be, sorry, so there would need to be considerable research and discussion before one could actually claim that no other Christian religions apart from Jehovah's Witnesses follow these stipulations. Almost all Christians believe in them. Let us examine each of these items in turn to see how they are used to differentiate the witnesses from other religious groups. Okay, so looking at that point number one, God's servants base their teachings on the Bible. The implication here is that only Jehovah's Witnesses' teachings are based on the Bible. Other religious groups may claim to follow the Bible, but they actually do not because they interpret it wrongly. It is interesting to note that many other religious groups make the same sort of claims. That is, that they, and only they, interpret the Bible correctly. Anyone who does not interpret the Bible correctly is not basing their teachings on it. This is an unfair assessment, since many who do interpret the Bible incorrectly are at least making an effort to base their teachings on it. This mark would more accurately be worded God's servants have a proper understanding of the Bible. However, Jehovah's Witnesses would not measure up to such a standard, since they have had improper understandings of the Bible in times past, 
and acknowledge the possibility that they may have improper understandings now. Okay, number two. Those who practice the true religion worship only Jehovah and make his name known. This may be the only one that immediately sets the witnesses apart from others. In support of this claim, scriptures like Matthew 6, 9, uh, let your name be sanctified, and Acts 15, 14, where the Christians are called a people for God's name, are cited. Interestingly, most other Christians would accept that they believe in these scriptures and that they, in fact, help to make God's name known. But they realise that it doesn't simply mean that true religion has God's name in its title or that its members say Jehovah all the time. In the Bible, name is associated with reputation. And we can look at Insight volume number 2, page 468. It is God's reputation that should be of concern to Christians. Jehovah's Witnesses do indeed uphold the reputation of God, but are they really the only ones in the world to do so? The compilers of the list don't seem to remember what sanctifying God's name or carrying God's name means and say that if religions don't actually verbalise God's name on a regular basis, they can't possibly be the true religion. And this is how they narrow the field down quite a bit. It is true that Jesus said to his father, I have made your name manifest. But considering that nowhere in any extant Greek manuscript of the Christian Scriptures, does Jesus use God's actual name, nor do any of the apostles, preferring instead to call God Father? Jesus must have been using the word name in a less literal sense, probably as it is used in Ecclesiastes 7 1, Proverbs 22 1, and Hebrews 1 4, etc. Number three, God's people show genuine, unselfish love for one another. The witness teachers highlight the fact that Jesus told his disciples to love one another and use this as a standard to judge religious organisations. In particular, they highlight the fact that leaders of many other religions encourage participation in war in which people of the same religion on opposite sides kill each other. We agree that this is a violation of the principle of love, but wish to point out, one, that there are several religious groups who are against war, and two, that this principle is also manifested in other ways in which the witnesses themselves do not adequately measure up. And we'll be getting on to that later. Number four, true Christians accept Jesus as God's means of salvation. We know of no single Christian group who doesn't meet this criterion. Five, true worshippers are no part of the world. The witness teachers use John 18.36 to show that the true Christian organisation will maintain strict political neutrality. The scripture doesn't say anything about political neutrality, but even if there was a scripture that said as much, there are religions other than Jehovah's Witnesses who stay out of politics. Considering that there are laws about the separation of church and state in this country, which I'm imagining is the USA, it is difficult in this country for church organisations to involve themselves directly in politics. To be sure, the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses insist on neutrality, not only for the organisation, but for each and every individual member as well. But the strict neutrality they call for, which they claim is a fruit of true religion, is not commanded in the scriptures. 6. Jesus' true followers preach that God's kingdom is mankind's only hope. The purpose of this mark is to weed out any religious groups who place any amount of hope in a human government. In other words, if a religious denomination gives words of support to any political authority as if it can solve the world's problems, this is an affront to God's kingdom. Other religious groups do not believe this for two chief reasons. One, the Bible says that the superior authorities are God's ministers, servants, and he uses them to accomplish good. And we can see that in Romans 13, 4. And number two, they see God's kingdom as something spiritual rather than a literal government. The difficulties associated both with the choice of and the interpretation of these stipulations are apparent. However, there is an even greater problem associated with this sort of exercise. What makes the witness teachers think that 
These are criteria by which not simply to judge individual Christians, but entire religious organisations. The Bible says that people, people will be judged individually according to their deeds. Nowhere is there a scripture that says that religious institutions will be judged according to their deeds, and that everyone in a condemned organisation will also be condemned. This, in fact, would not allow for individual judgment according to one's deeds. Since, members, since membership in a false religious organisation alone would be sufficient to merit the ultimate punishment. It needs to be highlighted that the very idea of separating religious organisations into true and false is not borne out in the scripture in Matthew 7, 15-20. Jesus was speaking about false prophets, and a religion is not a prophet. For there to be a list of identifying marks of the true religion, there has to be such a thing as the true religion. And we should find this idea in the Bible. This one faith, Ephesians 4, 5, as the witnesses are taught, is not a whole religion per se, so much as a single religious organisation. Therefore, Christianity, according to witness teachers, cannot be considered the one faith. The one faith can, only, can be only one denomination of Christianity and no more. But from where do they get this idea? Is it in the Bible? Finding evidence for such a position in the Bible is difficult because the Bible never really speaks of denominations as we have them today. But it does occasionally speak of various institutions or groups within Israelite society or within the early Christian congregation that held different views about God, although agreeing with the larger brotherhood and the major ish issues. Another, ancient Israel was not homogenous, nor was early Christianity. Archaeology and history are also of help to us because it has been shown that early Christianity, even in the first century, had a diverse belief system, and that the Israelites had a diverse belief, belief system too. Within ancient Israel existed various organised groups, like the various priestly houses and the Sons of the Prophets guild. And God did not reveal himself through one group. In the Bible, we see him sometimes working through the kings, usually in the histories, sometimes through the priests in the priestly law codes, and sometimes through the prophets, in the books of the prophets. These groups existed side by side in ancient Israel, and if matters were anything similar to the way they are described in the Dead Sea Scrolls, these groups didn't always see eye to eye. Yet Israelites who had a wrong view of Jehovah, although criticised by some, are never condemned and shunned in the Bible. Only Israelites who began to serve other gods were condemned and punished with death along with pagans who attempted to sway Israelites into serving other gods. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23, 24, chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. So it is important here to make a differentiation between the Bible's condemnation of polytheism and the condemnation of groups within the same religion who believe, believe different things about their one God. In Jesus' time, we are aware of the Jewish groups called the Pharisees and Sadducees. There were many other groups as well, all with varying beliefs. Luke 20, verse 27. They existed for hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. If you lived in those days, let's say a hundred years before Jesus, when the Jews were still the chosen people, which group would you have belonged to? Was only one of those groups chosen? Or did God view the Jews all as one people? The Bible also alludes to different beliefs in the Christian brotherhood. Paul talks about some in the congregation who had a different view of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.13 Notice that he is not speaking about them in the third person to the elders, but he is addressing them directly as members of the congregation. And when some were saying, I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3, 3-4, to they weren't talking about apostles whose person, personality they liked better, as if they were in a fan club. They were talking about whose teachings they liked better. The idea of belonging points, 
the idea of belonging points to adherence. There would be no point of differentiating between Apollos and Paul unless there were differences in what these men were saying. And yet, the apostles never say that only Paul's people were the true Christians, or only Apollos' people. Paul never calls for the disfellowshipping of the Apollos people, um, nor does he refer to them as apostates. Instead, he urges the various groups to work together in unity as one body, despite their differences. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 9, and Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Only unbelievers were condemned, that is, those not believing in God and Christ. This is not to say that no Israelites or Christians were ever condemned, but if you take notice, they are condemned as individuals for disobedience, immoral acts, or for purposely deceiving people for dishonest gain. They are not condemned simply for being part of a different group of God-fearing Israelites or Christians. Can you find a single scripture that says otherwise? But the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses may insist that they are certain that there are certain actions that today's religions have taken that disqualify them as acceptable religions in God's eyes. In fact, they might say that no other religious group that calls itself Christian is truly Christian anyway. They might point out the blood guilt of certain churches and crimes that they may have committed. They might also point out that these religious groups teach false doctrines or that they mistreat their members. Granted, the leaders of many religions, yes, even Christian ones, have done some very bad things. After looking at all the evidence, the witness leaders say that every single other religion has done something to disqualify itself, and that, by a process of elimination, the witnesses win. But are they jumping the gun? First of all, they have not really examined every single religion on the face of the earth, especially the smaller ones. Second, can religious organisations be condemned because of a wrong interpretation of scripture? The Bible never says that every sort of false teaching makes a religion automatically unacceptable. After all, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses themselves even admit that in the past they have taught false doctrines. It reminds me of the February 2017 Watchtower where they say that um, because they're um, not inspired and that they are not infallible, that they have erred, erred in um, doctrinal matters in organisational direction, so they admit it, carrying on. And no doubt, if the light gets brighter as time goes on, some of the truth that they have today may end up being the error of tomorrow. So having a false doctrine does not make a church automatically false. What makes a teaching bad is if it encourages bad behaviour or if it dishonours God in some way. Have not the witness leaders also dishonoured God in the past with some of their own teachings? Do they have the right to cast the first stone? Especially given the fact that in 2013, this is me speaking again, uh, in that July 15th watchtower, they admit that they have not been authorised over all the master's belongings. Uh, they used to teach that that had occurred in 1918-1919, and that sort of was the basis for their authority. But now they're saying that that appointment doesn't come until when Jesus returns at the time of the Great Tribulation. Hmm. Carrying on. The witnesses are certainly correct in pointing out that a number of religions do not honour Jesus and his apostles' commands not to have leaders who become masters over the faith of others. Ironically, we feel that the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses have also violated these commands even more so than some other religions. A scripture the witnesses point to in order to show that God is collecting true Christians out of a host of false Christians is Matthew 13, 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. Indeed, if it can be established that wheat, true Christians, are now being separated from weeds, false Christians, a case could be made that only one denomination of Christianity is favoured by God. Jesus specifically says that the harvest of these wheat and weeds takes place at the conclusion of the system of things. When is this? The leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses teach that this period began when Jesus began ruling in 1914. 
How do they know that the con conclusion began then? It is only an assumption. They point out that the word for conclusion in Greek signifies a peri period of time rather than an instant of time, and so it could last a long time. That's a valid point, but it still doesn't tell us when the period begins. How long does the conclusion have to be? The clue is in Matthew 13, 41, 42, and 49 and 50. The conclusion of the system is when the angels are sent out by Jesus to separate the wicked from the righteous and then destroy the wicked. This matches the scripture at Matthew 24, 31 and 25, uh, verses 31 and 32. There is no doubt about it. The conclusion of the system of things is the time when Jesus comes to judge the world after the Great Tribulation. It is hard to figure out why the brothers who lead the organisation don't see the connection between these scriptures. Well, it's not in their best interest, is it? <laughs> if they're trying, like the Pharisees, they're trying to hold their position, um, you know, they have to hold to this, this understanding. So it is after the Great Tribulation that the separation of the wheat and the weeds takes place. And that would mean that the wheat and the weeds are still mixed together today. And, as yet, too difficult to, to, to tell apart. Notice that in Matthew 13, 28, the workers ask Jesus if they should do the separating then. Jesus tells them, no, that by no chance while collecting the weeds, you uproot the wheat with them. It is clear that before the tribulation, no harvesting separation is permitted to take place. So we have to ask ourselves, are Jehovah's Witnesses being taught to violate this command? Or, at the very least, is the command being disrespected when the Witnesses are encouraged to make a separation between true and false Christians? Keep in mind that if Jesus and the angels aren't ready to separate them, then the Witnesses are doing the separation without any divine help. Hmm. So much for spirit direction, eh? Only one item on the Jehovah's Witnesses list of identifying marks is actually identified explicitly as a mark of discipleship in the Bible. Jesus said, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love among yourselves. John 13, 35 Ironically, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught not to follow this command in the way that Jesus meant it. Since the leaders have rejected all other Christians on this earth, calling them false Christians, the witnesses think they only have to show this love among their own group. Do you see how by, re by redefining the word Christian, the witness leaders can get away with this? It isn't right, and it's in direct disobedience of this command. It's like a parent telling his or her children to love one another and then one child tells another that he or she is not his true brother or sister and so he doesn't have to show love to that one. Now here's a quote. I'm not sure where this comes from. He, he says here, The nations and churches of Christendom were not and are not a Christian. They are not God's servants. His inspired word says of them, they publicly declare they know God, but they disown him by their works because they are detestable and disobedient and not approved for good work of any sort. Which is a quote from Titus 1.16. And I imagine this comes from some witness literature. But you might say that Jehovah's Witnesses show love to everyone, including those who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Do they? Do they show love to other Christians when they deny their Christian character? Do they show love to other Christians when they withhold full and open friendship with them? Do they show other Christians love when they tell them that their Heavenly Father rejects them all and will not save them? Think about it. Are Jehovah's Witnesses encouraged to treat other Christians the same way as they treat fellow Witnesses? No. The love is of a lesser degree. Actually, I would say there's a great deal of disdain that they hold for other professed Christians. And you probably have seen, uh, I've even seen um, an elder in our congregation hop up on the stage and mimic, in a very unflattering way, a householder who said um, that he was a born-again Christian. 
and um, you know the, the audience laughed. You know, it was just shocking, really. So uh, he goes on to say, "They, the witnesses, are therefore partial in their love." And there's quite a number of watchtowers um, quoted here. I'll put this article, uh, the link to this article in the description because it's really quite good to have a, have a copy of this. But I'll just read what it says, uh, the last quote he has here, which is from the Watchtower, March the 1st, 1994, page 12. This is, this is quite shocking. What is the burden of Jehovah today? It is the weighty prof prophetic message from God's word. It is heavy with doom, announcing Christendom's imminent destruction. As for Jehovah's people, we have the weighty responsibility to declare this burden of Jehovah. As the end draws near, we must tell all that Christendom's wayward people are a burden, yes, oh what a burden to Jehovah God, and that he is soon going to rid himself of this burden by abandoning Christendom to calamity. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. In Ephesians 3, Paul talks about the division in the Ephesian congregation and says that he prays to God that they all be rooted and established on the foundation and that they know the love of the Christ which surpasses knowledge. What follows shows that he is urging members of the congregation, despite their differences of opinion, to put up with one another and be united. As it said there, love surpasses knowledge. So this is what Ephesians 4, 1-6 says. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, entreat you to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called, with complete lowliness of mind and mildness, with long suffering, putting up with one another in love, earnestly endeavouring to observe the oneness of the Spirit and the uniting bond of peace. One body there is, and one Spirit, even as you were called in the one hope to which you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all persons, who is over all and through all and in all. This is a crucial passage. Clearly, when Paul asks them to be rooted on the foundation, and when he says that there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, etc., he is trying to show that they have a common bond, the belief in Jesus, the, the Lord, and their faith in him. Maybe some of them were trying to make distinctions and separations, saying that we shouldn't view everyone as being in the same faith or worshipping the same Lord or getting baptised with the same baptism, and that their faith was better than that of others as Jehovah's Witnesses are taught. But Paul counsels them not to do this. When he says that Christ's love is more important than knowledge, he's trying to get them to see that knowledge is secondary to love. That unity among all Christians is vital. He says something similar in 1 Corinthians 12, 4-11, part of which reads as follows. There are a variety of ministries, and yet there is the same Lord, and there are a variety of operations, and yet it is the same God who performs all the operations in all persons. Now surely Paul was not speaking to only one specific denomination or ministry. What great revelation would it be for Paul to say that a group of people who all believed exactly the same thing and worked together for the same exact purpose were being helped by the same God? That would simply be a matter of common sense. This needed to be said because there were differences of opinion and different ministries and operations out there. He reminded them that despite their diversity, they should regard themselves as all working with and for the same God. Do Jehovah's Witnesses truly feel that way about other Christians? No. Their teachers push them to violate this counsel and they do not recognise that God is over all and through all and in all. By making distinctions and a separation of Christians and encouraging unity only among their own people, they are causing and encouraging disunity among the larger Christian brotherhood and are working against the Spirit of God. And I could add further that they are, they are making distinctions and separations when they disfellowship people 
for having a different opinion, which is what happened in my case. So, yet they blame the ones who who have a difference of opinion. They they blame them as as for making um the divisions. Yet it's them that throw you out, <laughs> not the other way around. Paul goes on to liken the brotherhood to a body and talk about how the diverse members of Christ's body all can work together in unity. Ephesians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 31. What the witness leadership is doing is saying to other Christian groups, in effect, because you are a foot, you are no part of the body. Or, because you are an eye, you are no part of the body. We have to remember that God has set the members in the body, each one of them, just as he pleased. Sorry about my sniffing. It is interesting that John 13, 35 is the only scripture that starts out by all this, by this all will know you are my disciples. And this is a scripture the witnesses are taught not to obey. If an individual witness decides to show love in a, in a more... Oh. Looks like there's some um oh sort of doubled up. Okay, sorry, I'll repeat that sentence. If an individual witness decides to show love in a more expansive way, they do this not because of what they have been taught, but in spite of it. It is a good thing that we will be judged individually according to our deeds. And I can think of like I remember a sister who went and helped at the Red Cross shop. Um, so expanding her love out into a greater community. But of course, as you know, witnesses would, they frowned upon that. You know, she shouldn't be doing that. She should be spending more time in the ministry or, yeah. So if you, if you try to help in the community, they feel that, no, you should be directing that into the organisation so it's really sad, isn't it? Only two paragraphs left. This exclusivism or sectarianism should no longer be practiced by Jehovah's Witnesses. We should be one with our Christian brothers worldwide. To be sure, when our brothers and other denominations commit sins, we would be wise to counsel them and criticise them in a loving way, as any family member would. But we should not reject them simply for being in another church, if we love God and neighbour. And of course, that works the other way too, that um, they should be able to criticise um, Jehovah's Witnesses. Some may wonder whether Jehovah's Witnesses can continue to be strong in their faith if they no longer believe they are the only true religion. Well, of course they can. There is much to be proud of in this religion. We are accomplishing more good, much good, and will continue to do so. We are pleasing our God, Jehovah, and helping people to turn their lives around for the better. We are practicing a form of Christianity that we believe is better in many ways than other forms. There is still much to have faith in and much to love about this great group of people. So that's the end of the article. Um, so I have no idea whether this uh, brother, well, it's, well it could be a sister, but it's probably a brother, um, is still one of Jehovah's Witnesses or not, whether he's become so disillusioned with the organisation. Um, this is from a few years ago, and for decades, different ones in the organisation have been appealing to the governing body to make changes where they feel that um, the organisation has gone away from from true scriptural teaching and behaving in an unchristian way. But we haven't really seen any indications that the governing body are trying to move the organisation in a better direction. They've come down even harder on, on shunning and they're becoming more controlling over people's um, lives. Uh, so I, I can't see any, I don't see any hope really for reform. Um, maybe just a slow fizzling. I don't know. But anyway, um, I hope you found this article interesting and ma mainly I've read it because I'm hoping that current witnesses might uh, get to the watch this video and it, it introduces some new thoughts in their mind, you know, because like he says in here, it's 
if you uh if if Jehovah God and Jesus look at other uh, Christians, um, professed Christians, and f and see them as acceptable, yet Jehovah's Witnesses uh, have been taught and believe that they're imitation Christians and that they've been rejected by God and they're weeds and they've been collected up and bundled up ready for the fire of Gehenna. Um, how in what in what way is that showing love of neighbour or love of your brother? You know, if if Jehovah views them as um, uh, brothers and sisters of Christ, um, then you're in a dangerous position if you're condemning them. So it's something to think about. I'm sorry this video has been so long. It was a long article. And uh, I'll say goodbye for now. Leave any comments that you have about the article if you've, if you've listened to the end. Okay, bye for now.